Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor. I'm a Sony Imaging Ambassador. It's probably worth mentioning that Sony don't ask me to make these videos and they certainly don't pay me to make these videos. I simply want to create this video to present some evidence about what the A1 is capable of. You don't have to take my word for it. Just look at the photographs I've been creating with this camera. Okay, so first off, if you're watching this uh, video, I would probably uh, mention that you should uh, watch this movie in 4K because I will be presenting some high quality images. It's not worth looking at uh, images on Instagram uh, for this 50 megapixel camera. Uh, the other thing I would say is if people think that I'm talking too slowly, just speed me up. And if you don't want to look at my face during this tutorial, just put a sticky note uh, over my face so you can enjoy uh, the photographs without looking at my talking head. Okay, so first off, there has been some rumors about um, the camera overheating when recording 8K. So I thought I would um, basically put a memory card in, switch it to 8K recording and see how long it would record for. Basically, it filled the memory card before stopped. So it didn't actually overheat at all. And uh, it wasn't cold because I'm down in Australia, which is the summer. So it was reasonably warm when doing this test. The only thing that I did to alleviate any heat concerns was just flip out the LCD screen a little bit. I also went in and did uh, high frame rate shooting. That's 100 frames per second uh, when you're using the camera maybe outside of the USA. That would be 120 frames per second. Uh, I let that go. It filled the entire CF Express Type A card uh, before shutting down. So again, it wasn't impacted by heat. When you're playing back that um, high frame rate movie, it would play for over two and a half hours. Ample footage if that's what you're trying to do. Also in standard frame rates, uh, 24, 25, 30 frames per second, etc. Uh, you're going to get over an hour on the uh, 80 gigabyte card. Now, some people will say, well, why don't you test it um, for, you know, 256 gigabyte cards? I'm not that sort of photographer. So uh, go and look at some of the uh, other reports from movie makers who generate three hour long movies, if that's your thing, in a single clip. I don't think there's that many uh, videographers out there that actually do that. So I think filling an 80 gigabyte file with no heat concerns is enough evidence for me. Now, the cam um, Sony sold this camera on both its um, uh, resolution 50 megapixels uh, and also its dynamic range they went to, they reckon it went from 14 to 15 stops dynamic range good way of testing dynamic range the ability for the camera to record rich detail in both the brightest highlights and shadows is put a high contrast subject in sunlight in front of the camera and so what you're looking at is this uh, is this guy Jimmy with black hair white clothing and we've got full detail in each of those tones as evidenced by that histogram or lower right you'll also see that i've cropped well in on jimmy there from the 8k file i've cropped into a 4k output file this is one of the uh, advantages of having such a high resolution sensor is that ability to crop very very aggressively so it's also using iaf and this is not a it looks like a portrait but jimmy's literally flying through the air uh, uh, doing this uh, kick punch pose here taekwondo pose so uh, also tested this out on birds i know there's a lot of bird photographers going to be interested in this camera so again uh, i'm uh, tracking this bird it, uh, the uh, bird iaf is kicking in not all of the time but occasionally helping me out i've tracked birds uh, successfully with the a9 without bird if so a little bit of extra help is um, is not untoward and certainly this is sort of the sort of thing that uh, will get better and better over time by a firmware upgrades without having to buy a new camera uh, a lot of stuff got backdated to the alpha 9 a7 III, a7 r3 when um, uh, sony were working with the uh, animal if technologies Okay, so this is Megra, uh, a wedge tail, or Magra, sorry, a wedge tail eagle at the sanctuary. Uh, this was born in the wild, but was rescued by the sanctuary. And so please don't uh, tell me that I should be photographing wild birds instead of captive birds. I only had this camera for 60 hours to do this test. Uh, one of the things that somebody emailed me about was uh, they were saying, is it true the Sony camera forward focuses so you get your eyelashes in focus and not the retina? I found this a bizarre question, to be honest. Um, 
this is something I don't photograph uh, with the idea of having three millimeters thickness of depth of field. Surely you would want the eyelashes and the retina and even the eyebrows sharp, not just one or the other. So I've taken this uh, photograph of uh, this guy, uh, Bo. Uh, it's wide open on a 135 lens at 1.8. So we're dealing with reasonably shallow depth of field. And if I uh, crop into a 4K image there, you can see I actually have the retina, eyelashes and eyebrows sharp. If you're only getting one sharp, you have to question what on earth are you doing? Why are you uh, trying to have a retina sharp without the eyelashes? Such a bizarre question, but I, I figure that somebody's doing that in a camera review who hasn't thought that through properly. High ISO performance, a lot of Alpha 7 R4 owners are very interested in the high ISO performance of this camera. So there is an image uh, shot at ISO 8000 and now we pay uh, spot the noise. Obviously this is a JPEG image. The uh, high ISO noise reduction is set to standard. So there is some in-camera processing, but it seems to have done a very good job. I uh, will have to wait a few more weeks before I can get access to the raw files. But uh, this is a very good um, sign of things to come. And uh, I would already stick my neck out and say this is a good high ISO performer. Uh, there is um, uh, another uh, Sheltie dog. Uh, this is Rafiki, also captured at ISO 8000. Apertures wide open. Uh, I'm using one two thousandth of a second to freeze these dogs running in low ambient light. And you can see from just the details in the hair around the mane there, we're not sacrificing too much, too much detail just because we're shooting in high ISO. It did occur to me though, however, I should switch the high ISO noise reduction off in camera and do zero noise reduction in post. The other two previous images had no noise reduction in post either. So this is, I've basically gone to the dogs and photographed these dogs uh, racing towards me. It's something over 40 miles an hour, 70 kilometers an hour. And uh, I've got the animal IF. I dare say it's working occasionally, uh, just like with the uh, bird IF. And uh, again, we're going to play spot the noise, even though there is zero noise reduction done in camera or in post at 3200 ISO. Had this been an Alpha 7 R4, I'm sure we would be looking at something entirely different here. Now, obviously, a lot of sports photographers using the prime lenses don't have the ability to crop in, sorry, zoom in closer. So they're going to crop to get closer to their hero element. So I've cropped the 8K file to 6K, 24 megapixels, high ISO, 1250. We're still playing spot the noise here, even though zero noise reduction has been done in post. If you want to see noise, just ramp the ISO higher. This is um, a nighttime now with just the artificial lighting at the Greyhound track. We're seeing 20,000 ISO, zero noise reduction in camera or in post. This isn't something you're going to want to share on, on social media or give to your clients, but there is no noise reduction done. I just want you to see that there is some noise at some levels. Now, only time will tell to see whether this noise is maybe a little bit worse than an A9, A92 or A73, but certainly up to 10,000 ISO. I'm feeling quite comfortable with this camera. There's also been a lot of discussion about this 30 frames per second. I understand from my email box that some reviewers are saying that they're not getting it. Um, that is just poor familiarity with setting up Sony's, I have to be honest. I've always got the frame rates that Sony have uh, stated, whether it's 8 frames in high, uh, 10 or 11 frames in high plus, 20 frames per second on the A9 cameras. I've always hit it right to that number. So let's go through some of the workflows and take a look at why some of these variables might exist for less experienced camera reviewers. Okay, I'm working not with Sony's fastest lens, but um, the FE 200-600, it's fast enough, but it's not their fastest lens. So we'll see uh, when we're using uh, AF tracking, um, we're only getting, well, only, we're getting 25 frames per second. That's 100 images captured in just four seconds. Now, in order to uh, make sure that we've got that high frame rate, um, uh, getting up towards that 30 frames per second, you do need to go into priority set in AFC and set that to release. I am aware of one very popular review who's always been setting that to 
AF. Not balanced emphasis, but AF. And that will reduce the frames per second. I don't think that reviewer was aware that what he was doing was slowing the frame rate down because he did uh, accuse the camera manufacturers of lying about their frame rates. Now, if we put a, um, a slightly faster lens on, well, uh, quite a lot faster, the FE135 G Master lens with dual linear XD focus motors. Now we're moving that up over 26 frames per second, 26.66 recurring, in fact. OK, so we're still not hitting the 30. So how do you hit the 30? Not by switching the autofocus off, as one reviewer uh, said that you had to do, which is really shocking that that was actually stated because it's the tracking that is slightly slowing the camera down as it tries to confirm uh, the position of the subject in relation um, uh, and, and then move the lens elements accordingly. So if you just switch from uh, tracking to wide or zone, you will hit the nail on the head. You will get that 30 frames per second. So I shot 240 frames, eight seconds. That's exactly 30 frames per second. So that's that's where Sony is getting its figure from. Now you might say, well, who would not want to use tracking? Well, I have to say that, you know, before tracking, we used to use focus technologies that didn't require tracking. And one I would have to say in my own workflows, I only need to use tracking 10% of the time. If your subject is front and center in the frame, which is generally what we try to do most of the time, then you don't actually need to be using tracking. So this doesn't use tracking. Um, the IAF, the bird IF, will occasionally kick in, but just setting the camera too wide, you'll get your 30 frames per second. You'll get your decisive moment, which I'm highlighting there with the bird with the open claws. We zoom in. Yes, it's, it's pin sharp. And yes, we were getting the 30 frames per second, which you would want to do with these explosive actions. OK, so many reviewers, I'm sure, were just taking pictures of tulips and vases and their pet dog not what this camera was designed for. Fast action, okay, high resolution, and uh, 8K movies maybe, but not portraits in your home, shooting pictures of your dog eating his dinner. Okay, we, we've got other much cheaper cameras to do that uh, more than adequately. Okay, so this is Jimmy. You might think he's posing for a portrait, but he's actually um, uh, making me very worried by uh, sending blows within inches of the camera. So he's darting around and uh, I'm getting... Uh, um, pin sharp images. The human IAF is pretty rock solid these days. It didn't start out that way, which is why I say um, the animal IAF has been getting better and will continue to get better. And eventually the bird IAF, which is the newest one of the three, will catch up. And who knows, maybe one day the camera will auto switch between the three. Won't be that. Uh, that'll be something to look forward to. So we got the animal IAF, not pet IAF. This is a greyhound hitting 70 kilometers an hour in the corner, banked over. And I'm, I, if, if it only happens two frames out of eight, I'm glad I've got that animal IAF because that's always going to ensure the eye is sharp and maybe not the tip of his nose. Talking about tips of nose, obviously this works seamlessly when the dogs are not running and we're not using the tracking. Now, just a word about uh, my settings here. I'm shooting um, 30 frames per second, one two thousandth of a second as my default. Occasionally I want to grab a portrait. So I don't bother going into the camera settings. I just use the recall custom hold one, which I've assigned to the AEL button, which uh, drops from 30 frames per second to single shooting. And it drops the one two thousandth of a second to one five hundredth of a second, which lowers the ISO. And I do that just by holding the AEL button. Very quick override. So uh, let's take a look at uh, more birds in flight here. This is um, tracking this uh, bird with the 200-600 with the bird IF. Now it may look good on a, even your 27 inch 4K screen, but I have to say when I was zooming in for the croppability of these files, okay, there, there was a little bit of concern for me. Now we're using the Alpha one with the 200-600. It had been performing really well with the humans and with the dogs, the animals. But with this fast moving um, uh, smaller bird that was uh, changing direction uh, frequently, I wasn't getting the sharpness that I have experienced, maybe even using an Alpha 9 or an A7R 3 camera. So I'll have to do uh, more testing uh, to uh, work out what is going on here. OK, so but as soon as I switched lenses to the FE135 G Master and got closer to my eagle, it was 
uh, seamless. Okay, so um, we were getting uh, really sharp images. So I could, at 30 frames a second, just take my hero element there, uh, crop into 4K or even beyond 4K. And now we're really exploiting uh, the A1 advantages of high resolution, good dynamic range. Remember, black feathers, white beak in sunlight, no lost detail. That's really good. And this is just the JPEG. Um, we're shooting at the uh, 20 to 30 frames per second, maybe 25, 26 with tracking, 30 frames per second, just setting the AF area to wide. And we're using that bird IF as a little bit of extra support. And there we go. Really, you know, what is there to complain about? Okay, this, uh, this, this was a really explosive action from this eagle who launched over to do a somersault to catch something with his uh, claws there before passing it to his mouth. Not all bad news about that 200, 600. I don't want you to get overly concerned. I just have to do more testing. I did want to catch up with you guys before you read too many negative reports from a lot of camera reviewers who, quite frankly, just don't shoot enough images. Uh, they read the spec sheets, they have opinions, and they put it out really early so they get the most clicks and views because they're earning their income off the Google advertising associated with the YouTube video. I would prefer to wait a little bit longer. I would normally wait until the raw files had been looked at but I do want to get in and um, just balance the scorecard for this particular camera at this time. Uh, I was emailed about uh, from somebody saying do you advise that I use center fix uh, AF area for tracking birds and I went what? Uh, that's that's probably the last focus area I would consider using. So um, not too sure about that. Obviously, if you tag it on the subject and then uh, you've got tracking enabled, it will it will track the subject. But I'm a bit curious as to why choose that one when we could just choose zone or wide, hook on to the image and, and not even have to bother trying to put a focus area on a moving target. Now, 90% of the time for most people's images, the camera will just lock on automatically onto the subject because in 90% of 90% of photographers' images, the subject is front and center. And uh, the Sonys are exceptionally good at picking up the subject and it will then automatically switch to Animal IF if you have that enabled. Now, another way of overriding from the wide AF area, if you're not wanting to use tracking because you've got that 30 frames per second uh, requirement, you can uh, very quickly move into tracking and override the wide to go into uh, wide with tracking or spot with tracking. One of the ways to do that is if you're just wanting to go from wide uh, to wide tracking, you can reassign the AF on button to tracking on and AF on. And so it will pick up a subject. And then if it starts moving and going behind other subjects, which is why you want to use tracking, is if your primary subjects gets obscured from view temporarily by obstacles uh, or other dogs or other uh, sports players, then that tracking can be very useful. And the one, the way, the way you do that is just press the AF on button and it will lock on and start tracking your subject. Another way, and a lot of reviewers have missed this one completely, even though it's been around probably for nearly two years, is we can now override wide and put a spot tracking via touch tracking, which is now on the A7R4, the A92, the Alpha 7C. This is the fourth camera, and I don't see it getting mentioned by very many reviewers, if at all. And so the way to do that is just to enable touch operation, enable touch tracking, and make sure your um, your monitor is behaving as a touchpad. And then if you want to uh, identify a subject that's um, that to track, you just put your thumb on the monitor, slide it to your subject, and you get basically spot tracking uh, without having to go into menu items. And uh, I locked on to a dog that was stationary, waiting for the owner to say go. And the reason I wanted tracking in this instance, because I was aware from a previous run, the dog will go onto the owner's shoulder. That's Bo there with the uh, Frisbee. And the dog may be partially obscured for one frame by the blue cap. And so we don't want uh, to pull focus on the blue cap for those one or two frames. So I'm basically tracking the dog. So it ignores Bo, which will be closer to the camera than the dog just for that one or two frames. OK, so let's moving on to um, people who may be worried about 50 megapixel files slowing their workflow down. Now, it shouldn't if you just dot your I's and cross your T's on this one. 
Uh, and one of the reasons for that is yes, the camera will support your existing SDXC2 cards with the 300 megabytes per second read write times, but we've now got CF Express cards, which are nearly triple the speed. So we're looking at uh, double the resolution, but triple the speed. That buffer is going to that's basically the number of um, shots you can capture before slowing the camera down and before typically in older models you could access menu items. That, that buffer is going to empty in just a few seconds. Uh, and yes, you can actually change the menu items. I was changing uh, subject detection, uh, ISO auto minimum shutter speed, focus area with the camera still writing. I could have just waited two or three seconds and the buffer would have been cleared to the memory cards anyway. So I would recommend uh, one of those CF Express cards, even though they're a little bit on the pricey side. Now, in order to get the data off the camera, um, we've got a super speed USB-C port there. Um, that's 10 gigabytes per second. That's very fast. OK, so you're going to get those um, those files off the card and onto uh, an external device exceptionally quickly. That might have been gigabits rather than gigabytes, sorry. So we're looking at um, uh, very fast workflows. You can see I'm actually in that uh, lower right side there. You can see I'm I'm uh, getting all of the files off um, the memory card onto a computer in just one minute, or just over one minute. Now you can do that directly from the camera or you could use a, a CF Express a card reader. Sony's CF Express card reader also takes the uh, SDXC2 cards. You can, and this is probably the biggest impact to your workflow, is you really don't want to start putting one terabyte of files on from three days shoot, which is what I shot onto a laptop. You basically want to direct them to an external uh, drive. This SSD drive, uh, which is really, really fast, won't be the um, the bottleneck in this workflow. It'll still be that fast card, in fact. And so you're getting maximum speed and you're not clogging up your hard drive of your laptop, which you're using to review the files. When I did my preview video, one person said you should be um, comparing this not to the Canon 1DX Mark III, which is the same price as the Alpha 1. You should be comparing it to the R5. I found that a little bit odd because for me, the R5 on the spec sheet is not a pro level camera. I'm sorry if you're a Canon supporter on this one. Let's just take a look at one feature here and see how the spec lists compare. Um, we've got blackout when we're shooting um, uh, 20 frames per second on that Canon R5 and the blackout does make it more difficult to follow erratic fast sports. Now we're shooting with the um, electronic shutter on the Sony, so the zero blackout. So it makes it much easier to swing the camera around chasing an erratic subject. So that's zero blackout. That's a refresh rate on that uh, monitor is 240 frames per second when we're doing sports. That's twice as fast. So you're not going to get any sort of latency or lag on that. If you are shooting more static objects and you want to go for resolution, then we've almost got double the resolution on that viewfinder again. You will need to switch between um, a prioritizing uh, refresh rate frames per second in the viewfinder and also resolution. And we've got this huge um, big uh, um, EVF or Finder here. I don't think there is a better one on the market at the moment. Uh, first seen on the Alpha 7 S3, now seen on the uh, Alpha uh, 1 camera. Huge, uh, big, bright viewfinder, which has got fabulous uh, feedback to what it is you're viewing. An interesting uh, thing, and I really wasn't expecting this, is we can now do flash using the electronic shutter. I thought we were going to have to wait for global sensors before we uh, saw this. But now uh, we can not use that uh, mechanical shutter when using the flash. OK, might, one might wonder, so why do we need a mechanical shutter at all? Well, you could use it to protect your, protect your sensor from dust. OK, um, so there you go. We have uh, an option now when powering down the camera uh, to when we're changing lenses, the sensor won't be exposed to dust. I do hasten to say, and Sony does warn people, that the, the shutter mechanism is a delicate mechanism. So you don't want to be prodding it with your fingers and marveling at the mechanical shutter, which you never use. Um, 
But another thing that that mechanical shutter will do, other than just keeping dust off your sensor, is Sony have increased the uh, the, the maximum sync speed from uh, one two fiftieth of a second using a Sony flash to one four hundredth of a second. That may not seem like a big deal unless you're using flash as a primary light source and you're trying to underexpose the background ambient light. It's very difficult competing with the sun when you've got a small uh, pocket strobe with you. And uh, certainly I carry around not the biggest one, but the 45 RM rather than the 60 RM. So having that one 400th per second does mean in the middle of the day I could underexpose the background by two stops or even more, um, even using my um, uh, HVL 45 RM flash through a lighting modifier off camera. Okay, so that's not even on the hot shoe there. Now, I, in order to control that off camera flash, I am using a smaller HVL F28 RM flash. Uh, this one doesn't have an LCD panel, so you might be wondering how do I set the power output or um, uh, configuration between channel one and channel two. Well, that's all done through the uh, electronic viewfinder or the monitor on the back of the camera, which now talks to the Sony flashes. Very useful. Uh, other people will marvel at the touch operation of this camera. Um, it was first seen in the Alpha 7S III uh, camera and there's been a, a big uh, rethink or organization and obviously we can touch those menu items now. I have to say, I, I mean, I'm not going to use the touch menus that much and I might even switch them off because I don't actually um, use the menus. The reality is, is when I've set up my camera, the function menus, which I can press and access the menus uh, by pressing the FN key. And I've got a different FN menu, whether I'm shooting videos or stills. And then I can just use the front and rear dials to change settings. I don't go into the menus to do that. If you're using a, a 7 um, a camera, an Alpha 7 camera, you'll also be pleased to know that we've got that hard physical uh, dial on the top left of the camera, which frees up two more custom keys. You might actually be scratching your head when you're setting up this camera thinking, I've run out of things I can think to assign to the custom keys, which is a good indication that you probably won't be going into the menus when you set up this camera. To give you an example, I've set up a custom key three for ISO auto minimum shutter speed on the top of the camera. I can just press that, don't even need to lower the camera from my eye, change that setting. So the fact that I could touch the screen isn't of issue to me because the camera is at my eye. Final, obviously the killer question here is, okay, so do you need an Alpha 1? Okay, so if you've got an Alpha 7 R4, you don't typically shoot action sports, you don't typically raise the ISO over maybe 1600, then you know you would have to question why would you want an Alpha 1? Okay, so, and obviously the Alpha uh, 7 R4 has more megapixels and it has a huge dynamic range, which we know. Alpha 9.2, if you're needing more megapixels, then obviously the Alpha 1 will deliver, but a lot of uh, photojournalists and um, uh, um, sports photographers working for the newspapers and magazines, 24 megapixels is enough because they actually crop smaller than 4K. A lot of the time they only need a couple of megapixels, so they can be much more aggressive when cropping on a 24 megapixel file. So um, maybe that's not a logical upgrade for an Alpha 9.2 owner either. Alpha 7S3. Now, if you're into shooting um, uh, high quality videos at 51,200 ISO, where your only light source is the light from the moon, then maybe you're not going to go for the Alpha 1, even though it's got 8K movies. So each of those premium level cameras in their certain segments still do a great job for less money. I have to say, I do a bit of everything, okay? I don't do that much video, but um, I will certainly value the 4K performance, the 422 10 uh, bit movies here, where I can um, edit more aggressively and I have the picture profiles. Um, so that I will enjoy using that. So I don't have any need for an Alpha 7 S3. Um, I'm thinking uh, I will wait a little bit longer before I think the Alpha 9 II has been replaced 
and need to see how it's performing at ISO values above 10,000 by looking at the raw files. And uh, I know the 200, 600 performs really well on the Alpha 9 too. And there was that little bit of concern I have with the Alpha 1, which I have to work on. Remember, I am working with a pre-production camera here. So uh, there, there is still time to fine tune that uh, firmware by Sony before it finally ships. Alpha 7R4, I think this one's the one that's probably in most danger, to be honest. 50 megapixels may be enough for most people. It's got better, um, the Alpha One has got better movie capability with the 422 10 bit movies and the 8K movies, obviously. So uh, we're getting um, better movies, we're getting. Uh, we're getting almost the same resolution and um, we're getting better high ISO performance. Whether there's any future in uh, one or all three of these um, specialist areas, only time will tell, I think. One of the things that uh, is great to hear about this camera, even if you're not going to buy it or you can't afford it, don't say it's expensive just because you can't afford it. Uh, uh, it's a, you know it's, it's like saying a Lamborghini is expensive just because uh, it's a it's a it's a premium product. The great thing about one of these premium products is the feature set will roll down to more entry level, um, lower priced models eventually, whether it be later this year or next year. So we can look at basically what's to come for um, cheaper cameras. I'm really glad to see the stacked. Uh, backlit illuminated sensor uh, has finally found a, a third camera after the A9, A9 II. So we see there's development in this area because this is the most sophisticated sensor currently being designed um, by Sony, well, perhaps let's say any camera manufacturer. It just gives um, so many more possibilities for the future of interchangeable lens cameras. I'll just go out with a few images because I know I know a lot of camera reviewers are a little bit sparing on their images. So let's take a look at some uh, beautiful uh, dogs in uh, in flight here um, and uh, uh, some just marvel uh, images here. I may have cropped in, I might have gone full frame, but you can see even just shooting the JPEGs in very high contrast lighting, we'd have just excellent performance from this camera and uh, there goes rain doing his aerobatics i said i did target him with that tracking and here he is uh, uh, admiring the camera <laughs> as he's caught the frisbee mid-flight there and there's jimmy full flight look how high he is off the ground don't uh, get to marvel about this until i'm reviewing the files and uh, there's me um, just descending from her jump with uh, the kick at the top. This is really where the 30 frames comes into its own because the frame either side of this one is significantly different to this hero decisive moment. And there is me and Jimmy together um, in flight together, if you like, uh, both pin sharp, um, both using that excellent human IAF. Okay, so hopefully um, I, you've enjoyed looking at the photographs and um, hopefully I've um, I've sorted out some of your questions, maybe raised by reviewers who are less experienced with Sony cameras, maybe just less experienced at taking pho photographs in general. Uh, I will come out with a more in-depth review and I will come out with a 450 page ebook, which will be free to download. And so, uh, and that, that will go into much more depth about this camera. And I might also release an extended version of this if you want to watch or listen to me for more than an hour talk about this camera. Again, showing the evidence that I have. Be sure to head over to my website, markgaylor.com. You will find uh, free to download resources. Thumbs up if you've enjoyed the video. Subscribe and uh, I'll catch you online next time.